the uh, sort of um, movements uh, of the ship that are caused by moving through waves uh, are uh, being uh, registered. It also registers wind, both the, the strength of the wind and the direction of the wind. And they use uh, redundancy for critical operations. So this is what we talked about with the, the DP class system, where they have the lowest class, DP1, where they basically don't have any backups. Redundancy basically means backup. And uh, where as you progress through the, uh, through the different classes, you are getting, uh, getting uh, more and more backup systems into place. So according to the Norwegian Maritime Authority and uh, also DNB, uh, they have two different ways of uh, signifying uh, what uh, DP class the ship has, uh, but they are uh, the requirements for setting a DP class, whether it's DNB or the Norwegian Maritime Authority. So the Norwegian Maritime Authority, they use DPS and then a number behind it, one, two, or three. And the NVGL, they start off with AUT. Uh, I ha haven't checked exactly what that is an abbreviation of, but they add, uh, add letters behind it. So uh, for the next class, they add one letter, and then for the uh, third class, they add uh, uh, a second letter. So, uh, so they have a slightly different way of showing what kind of uh, DP class it is. But with DPS1 or AUT, uh, there is no required redundancy, which means that if you have one single failure or malfunction, you're going to lose your position. So if one thing breaks, you're going to lose your position, which also means that you're not going to use a deep, uh, DPS-1 system uh, in a very critical uh, situation, so where you're close to, to something else where you could potentially drift into it and, and cause an accident. Uh, you only use uh, DPS-1 when it doesn't really matter all that much if you, if you stay in place or not. <coughs> and then you have DPS-2 or AUTR. There, one single failure or malfunction in active components, so a thruster, a generator, an engine, uh, a component that is actually performing uh, some of the work needed in order to keep the vessel in place, shall not cause loss of position. So that if you have one failure, you're going to still be able to keep your position. And then we have DPS-3 or AUTRO from uh, DNB. And here they've basically done the same as DPS-2, but they've added, uh, they have active, like in DPS-2, active components or passive components. And passive components, that is like um, uh, the cable trays that are going between, uh, between the components. So if, uh, if you have a break in a cable or, or something like that, that's not going to, uh, to allow you to lose, uh, lose uh, position either. So basically it means that you have to have two of everything uh, in it. Not only two of every component, but you also have to have two of every cable uh, going uh, along, both signal cables and uh, electric energy cables or and also uh, hydraulic uh, lines if you, uh, if you have a hydraulic system. Uh, they've also added uh, physical separation as a uh, requirement. So you have to physically separate the systems in the DPS. Uh, and that is often with regards to if something should happen and you have a hull breach uh, in your vessel, uh, parts of the vessel can be flooded without the uh, vessel actually sinking. So you can shut off parts uh, of the vessel. And uh, by physically separating the different parts of your system, you're making sure that even though you have to uh, shut off and let one part of the system be flooded, uh, you will still have the backup uh, in a physically separate location so, so that it will still be working. And also uh, extra requirements to fire protection and also an extra requirement to have an emergency bridge so that if something should happen to the main bridge of the vessel, uh, the crew can uh, move over to an emergency bridge and, and uh, resume work from there. So that they can uh, uh, basically just transfer control of the ship to the emergency bridge and then they can continue working. So uh, just to do an extreme example, if, uh, if the crane boom breaks and it crashes into uh, to the bridge housing and it just destroys the bridge, then you can still move over to the, to the uh, emergency bridge and, and still have function uh, on your ship. 
So, so uh, uh, the DPS3 system, it requires quite a lot uh, when you're, uh, when you're uh, designing and, and uh, manufacturing the ship. So th there's uh, a lot more weight due to having two of absolutely everything uh, for the uh, DPS system. Uh, and uh, also having extra fire protection and physical separation and an emergency bridge. There is suddenly quite a lot of space needed uh, for this. So a DPS3 system usually requires a bit larger uh, vessel so you can't have it on the on the uh, smaller vessels and uh, for different activities there is usually set what kind of uh, dp system is needed so here we just get uh, i've uh, split it in two this table uh, so a manned subsea operation where loss of position will cause great risk for diver or diving platform we of course need a uh, level three system so we want the safest system uh, there. Other manned subsea operations where loss of position causes risk for diver or diving platform, uh, we can go down to A2. <coughs> so uh, the, the difference between these two is of course great risk and just risk. How do you define great risk and risk? Uh, how do you separate those two? And that is, of course, uh, something that has to be uh, be uh, defined, uh, and uh, it is defined uh, in a different location in, in the rules and regulations. So it's uh, just not a part. The definition isn't a part of the table uh, setting it up. Uh, a support vessel for a manned subsea operation performed from a dinghy, so a, a very small uh, small boat, <coughs> where the loss of position of the support vessel has a direct consequence for the dinghy. So you have personnel out in this uh, small, basically, raft uh, that's out there, and uh, they're performing some work. Uh, and uh, you might actually just run them over with the ship if you lose your position. So, so then you need a two, so you need to have some, some uh, as, uh, backups in place. Drilling and well activities where well control is maintained by a unit with dynamic positioning. So then you need three. You really don't want to lose your position while you are drilling or maintaining control over a well. If you do lose your position, then you're going to drift off and you're just going to snap off uh, all of the equipment that you've got connected. And it's just going to release uh, everything that's in the well, basically. And we'll have a free flow out. A unit which produces or stores hydrocarbon, so an FPSO or uh, uh, FPS. <coughs> and they also need a three. A uh, flotel with attached gangway, which is uh, um, usually a three, uh, but during arrival and departure, uh, it is acceptable with just a two uh, for it. Activities performed by a lifting vessel or pipeline vessel in close proximity of a fixed or floating unit. So then we have a three, but while they are moving into position, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, acceptable just having a two. <coughs> um, and then other activities within the safety zone where the vessel represents a risk to the units, a two. Tanker offloading from unit that handles hydrocarbons, a two. Loading operations from buoys, then you just need a one. That's not that, the, the, the buoy isn't uh, manned or anything like that, so um, you only have you're only risking some damage to equipment. You're not risking uh, lives or uh, major spills or anything like that. Other well activities applies to units for well maintenance if well control is maintained by another unit. Uh, so then we have two. And shallow drilling if it's not expected to hit hydrocarbons. So if you're doing uh, drilling for research purposes or maybe uh, what's being uh, becoming more and more uh, uh, more and more done now is drilling for for minerals actually to check what kind of minerals you can find down there it's a growing field uh, uh, with regards to starting to to do mineral extraction so that you can actually get different kinds of uh, of uh, metals uh, from uh, uh, from the ocean floor so um, if, if you're drilling and there is absolutely no uh, no reservoirs close by or anything like that then you then it's okay with a, a dps1 because you're not going to have a major major environmental accident I if something happens. You're just going to destroy your equipment. <coughs> uh, when we're working with uh, a DP, 
system, we have the DP capability plot. And uh, the way we read this one off is that we basically have the, the shape of the vessel in the middle here. So we can't really see it, uh, but that's the center of, uh, of this one is also the center of our vessel, so the, the midpoint of our vessel. <coughs> then we have the, uh, the degrees coming off here. So we can read off degrees, 30 degrees, 60, 90, 120, all the way around here to 360. And those are the degrees of the wind direction. So th those are telling us where the wind is coming from. Uh, and then we have uh, the different circles that are going around here. So we, ha we have the 10 circle, 20 circle, 30 circle, 40, and then 50 in the outer one. And that's the wind speed, meters per second. So, so uh, we can have quite a lot of wind uh, coming in here. So actually the, the wind, it doesn't say anywhere that it's uh, wind speed in meter per second, but uh, that's what it is. <coughs> and in this case, the vessel has a draft of 16 feet. So divide it by three and you'll get it in meters approximately. And then we have the current speed, which is basically the velocity of the waves as they are hitting the, uh, the vessel where the, uh, the blue line means that we have a calm sea. We might have quite a lot of wind, but we at least we have a calm sea. We don't have any, any current uh, in the water. Uh, then we can have the green one, which is one knot, blue one, which is two knots, and the red one, which is three knots. So you have uh, uh, basically a really heavy current hitting the ship. So the way we read off this one is, let's say we have a... Um, wind direction, the wind is coming at a 60 degree angle. So it's, so it's coming along this line here. So the wind is coming in towards the ship along that line. And if we then have a, um, so let's say 40 meters per second wind, we come in along the 60 degree line and we stop at the 40 meters per second uh, circle, which is going around here. So we stop over here and then we see we have the yellow current speed line so that it's two knots. So that means if we have 40 meters per second wind coming from a 60 degree angle, we won't, won't be able to handle a three knot current speed. So if we both get 40 meters per second wind and three knots of current coming in at the 60 degree angle, then we're, uh, we're going to drift off our position. Even though we have uh, a, a DP class of three, we're still going to drift off b because basically the thrusters of the vessel aren't strong enough to, to stay in position. So, so they can't counteract all of this force. And here you can see if, uh, if it's coming from the front, so zero degrees, we have, uh, it doesn't really matter. We, we can handle uh, 50 meter per second wind and uh, full, full effect of, uh, of the uh, current. <coughs> but again, wind from uh, 90 degrees, we can uh, barely handle, so let's say 27, 28 meters per second of wind uh, if we have three knots in uh, wave velocity there. And then we can have uh, a maximum if we have calm sea, so we don't have any current affecting the vessel, we can have a maximum of around 45 meters per second. So we can't even handle uh, only 50 meters per second wind uh, directly from the side. That's still going to push the vessel uh, off of position. <coughs> so that's the way you, you read off a, 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 a DP capability plot. <coughs> and that's going to, uh, usually you'll find it in, in the data sheet for the vessel. So you'll find the uh, capability plot in there. So you can actually go in and lo look at what kind of uh, weather is going to, to push this vessel off course or off position, rather. <coughs> then we'll look a little bit at deck space. So with deck space, uh, we have, uh, in this case, we have a moon pool. So uh, most likely above the moon pool here, there is a, a uh, module handling system in place. Uh, it's not been drawn in there, but we have a moon pool and we also have these rails going uh, along it. So uh, there is definitely a, a, a module handling system above uh, this moon pool. We have different kinds of uh, equipment that's going to be lowered down, uh, different modules uh, placed here on the, uh, on the uh, rails. So they are ready to be 
pushed into the center and then over to the moon pool and, and uh, lowered into place uh, when needed. Here we have the uh, first work ROV, so WO ROV. And then we have the second work ROV. So this, is, this will be the, uh, the module, uh, no, the, uh, the, not the module handling system, but the, the LARS, the launch and recovery system, and the ROV itself will be placed uh, in these locations. Here we have uh, a small workshop, so probably a container uh, with room to, to put, the, uh, put the ROV inside in order to, uh, to work on it if it needs some uh, repairs. And here uh, it's probably also a container where we have the control room for, for the work ROVs. Up here we actually have an observation ROV that can be uh, lowered into the water and just observe what's going on. <coughs> Uh, yeah, and here we actually have a module handling system container. So, so uh, that's probably the. Uh, uh, this is probably there's an HPU. So this is the control system and uh, and the hydraulics uh, for for the module handling system. That's being used there. So here you can see basically how you have to sort of lay out all of the uh, deck space that you have available just to see. Uh, we're going to have to be able to move around the uh, ROV workshop container. Uh, we're going to have to be able to move around here. Uh, and we're also going to have to be able to move these uh, um, without being obstructed uh, in any way. So they have, to, they have to be able to move along the rails here. And you can see over on this side, you actually have two modules placed on the same rails, which hopefully whoever set up this knows that this module is going to be lowered down first so that they don't have to switch them around when they're uh, out there. Uh, so you, ha you have to do quite a lot of planning wh when you're going to do uh, an offshore operation with, with regards to where you place stuff uh, on, the, on the deck. <coughs> um, but not only do you have to think about where you're going to place it on the deck, but also the deck has a certain capacity, uh, like on the... Uh, um the Appendix A for, for the diving uh, section, which we looked at yesterday. I think it said 10 tons per square meter uh, of deck uh, was what it could handle. But, but that means that you have an evenly distributed 10 tons on that square, uh, square meter. The problem is if you have a, a uh, module, which is, uh, let us say, um, 10 square meters across, and it weighs 100 tons. So that's going to be 10, uh, uh, 10 tons per square meter. It's not a problem if you just look at it like that. But the problem is that this module has four legs. So it's standing on four legs on, on, the, uh, on the deck space. So it's going to, on deck, it's going to, to be a sort of a commandeering an area of 10 square meters because that's, where it's th that's how much it's going to, to cover. So, so you can't put anything else there. But the part of the, the module that's actually going to be in contact with the deck are the four legs. And they might have uh, quite a lot less area so that you would get a lot more weight on that area for each of the four, uh, four legs, which means that you actually have to check, uh, check the, uh, uh, the point loads I in the different areas. So you need to make sure that each of those areas where the, where the feet are located are going to be able to handle this weight. And if they can't handle it, you're actually going to have to go in and you are going to have to strengthen the deck before you place, the, uh, place it there. So you're going to have to basically just weld in extra beams beneath deck in order to strengthen it so that it's going to, going to be able to handle the weight. <coughs> it's not unusual to have to strengthen a deck with steel beams or double plates before loading heavy equipment. So, so double plates is another way of doing it. So you don't necessarily have to go in underneath deck and, and, uh, and strengthen it with extra beams and weld them into place. You could also place uh, a thick plate on deck before you place your module on top of that thick plate because that's going to help you distribute uh, the force over a larger area so that uh, it's going to help uh, get a more even distribution of the force. Uh, so... so Preferably, you would just put down a, 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 an extra plate on top of the uh, deck if you can, 
Uh, if not, you have to go in with steel beams and uh, strengthen it. And as I mentioned, the, the average permitted load per square meter, it's not enough to just calculate that uh, and see that it's enough. You, you have to uh, look, look at the point loads where you're actually placing uh, the equipment. Because on the deck, uh, you might have certain areas of the deck where you have uh, quite a lot of structure underneath the deck, so that it's going to be quite stiff. There are a lot of beams underneath deck uh, just to hold the rest of the structure up so, so that it's going to be pretty strong. But then you have other parts of the deck where you will have long stretches between your beams because you don't need these uh, heavy beams there. Just like uh, if you think in the roofs here, you don't have uh, uh, quite a lot of beams in here. You just have uh, exactly what you need in order to keep the get the correct strength for it. So, so whoever has designed the ship, they've said that 10, square me uh, 10 tons per square meter, uh, if we put in this many beams across the main part of the deck, that's going to uh, give us that strength. But then when you come in and put your heavy equipment there, standing on four legs, uh, and putting quite a lot of load in, in just one spot, you, you risk that you're actually going to, to crush the deck in, in that uh, position. So you, you need to be able to calculate uh, the point load in that area. And that's something that you're actually going to, uh, at least I think, unless Runal has changed it too much in the mechanical design 2 uh, part, we're going to, uh, to learn the SAP 2000 uh, software, which uh, uh, Frederick mentioned. Uh, that is one uh, such software where you can actually calculate. You put in uh, different uh, sections of I-beams, uh, and then you have plates on top of it, and you can calculate what kind of load it's going to be able to handle. So, so you have, you don't, uh, you don't sit down with pen uh, and paper uh, and start calculating this uh, stuff. Uh, you usually do it through uh, 3D models and, and the software to, uh, to basically analyze how much you need to strengthen it. And also the stability of the ship. We've already talked a little bit about ship stability. And it's often not enough that the total load is within the maximum load of the vessel. Again, with the having the drum horizontally or, or vertically, uh, it has something to do with the center of gravity also. So tall, heavy equipment will affect the uh, center of gravity greatly, and this will have a negative effect uh, on the vessel. So whenever, I whenever it is being uh, uh, rotated over to one side, it's going to rotate much further than what it, what it usually would without that equipment on because of that center of gravity. And in, in worst case, it's actually going to rotate so far that you have water leaking into the ship uh, if, if you get to that point. So <coughs> then we're going to look at crane capacity, crane characteristics, and heave compensations. So the critical phases during an offshore lift that is when we are lifting from deck after sea fastening has been loosened and out across the side of the vessel. And sea fastening, uh, sometimes uh, it's shaped more like uh, clamps where you're basically just clamping down the equipment to, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, deck so that you have pre-made uh, holes where you can put these clamps in place. It could be just uh, regular uh, straps where you're strapping it into place. It depends a bit on how heavy the equipment is. But for really heavy equipment, what's usually done is that the equipment is welded directly to the deck so that you get a weld seam that's actually holding it in place. So that when they're going, in order to, to loosen the sea fastening, they basically have to cut away the weld uh, b before they can, can lift it from deck. So uh, there are, uh, there are a, a couple of different ways of doing this sea fastening stuff. But one of the critical phases is the actual lift from deck and over across the side and, and down. And <coughs> of course, the critical part here is that you really don't want whatever it is that you're lifting to crash into something else on deck. Whether it is personnel working on deck or, or whether it is other equipment or parts of the vessel itself, you really don't want it to crash. You're going to harm whatever it is you're uh, lifting and you're also potentially harming whatever else it's crashing into. So that's a very critical part. And, and with, with the entire ship moving with the, uh, with the waves, 
uh, you are definitely going to have movements on your uh, on whatever it is that you're lifting also. So it's it's not like lifting something in a warehouse on shore because the the only thing affecting the uh, the pendulum movements of of the load hanging from from the uh, crane boom. So basically, if we have a crane boom here. with a mass in it. As the ship is moving back and forth, the mass is going to <coughs> do pendulum motions also back and forth. So just like a, a child swing, uh, when they swing. So it's going to start swinging back and forth. Um, and on land, in, in a crane in a workshop, the, the only thing that affects that pendulum motion is actually the, the uh, operator of the crane, how uh, how uh, quickly is the operator moving the crane. So if he's moving the crane a bit too quickly and suddenly stops, it's going to cause a pendulum motion. But usually crane operators are moving them. Uh, they, they sort of have a gut feeling of how quickly they need to move it. And then they also have ways of sort of catching this pendulum mo uh, motion when they, when they uh, reach the end position where they're supposed to be. Well, on a ship, that is pretty impossible uh, to, to have a gut feeling for it because you have all of these wave motions that are interfering with you. So you can't, even though the crane operator is moving uh, pretty smoothly and, and uh, thinks he has full control, we can suddenly have a wave come in there and either exa exaggerate the movement that he is doing or sort of counteract it so that it the, the load is doing something completely different from uh, what's what he intended. Which is also one of the reasons why they usually have all of these uh, extra wires connected to winches in order to sort of keep keep the modules in place while they are lifting them. Then the next critical phase is when they are lowering the module through the splash zone, so through the waves. And that one is critical with regards to uh, whatever it is that they're lowering down. If it's, if it's large enough, let's see here, crane. If it has a large enough uh, cross-sectional area, it's going to get um, quite a lot of hydrodynamic mass underneath it when you start lowering it down. And it's also going to get quite a lot of damping. So that means that while uh, when the ship is tilting this way, it's going to put a lot of tension on the, uh, on the uh, lifting wire because it also suddenly has to lift, uh, uh, lift the hydrodynamic mass. And then when the uh, ship is tilting this way, uh, it won't sink right away, because it needs to start moving. Uh, it needs to, uh, to get all of the inertia moving, both for the, both for the hydrodynamic mass and for the entire, uh, entire uh, uh, module. And there might possibly be uh, pockets of air trapped in there and stuff like that, which uh, takes a bit longer to fill with water which is means that it won't sink as fast as the wire as the tip of the crane is moving downwards so you can get slack I in your in your uh, crane uh, or in your lifting wire so basically if it tilts over we get the crane tip over here we can suddenly have slack in the lifting wire and then as soon as the ship flips back over to the other side with the waves it's going to snap this uh, lifting wire taut and then put tension on it and that's uh, that's really bad because that's usually a, you, you can get enough force then to, to basically just snap the wire so it's uh, it's easier to snap a wire if it's been if it's ha if it has a slack and then you pull it quickly uh, tight it's going to snap easier than if you already have it tight and you just keep on pulling because you get this sort of shock force moving through it so lowering through the splash zone is uh, is a critical phase and then the next one is when you are landing the equipment, either on the seafloor or on a structure or something. So, and so once you've gotten it past the waves, uh, and maybe you have, have uh, a couple of kilometers that you actually need to lower it down, then you can just lower it. It's not going to be uh, much of a problem. Uh, but as soon as you start reaching the end position on the seafloor or on a structure, you need to start slowing down and, and uh, start thinking about getting a, a nice and safe landing. Uh, there. <coughs> we'll do a break, and I think we'll do.
Right, so I think we'll do a uh, short half hour uh, on this one, so that you get some more, more time uh, before uh, the lecture with Torbjörn. We had a hard day yesterday. We don't need to make an extra hard day today. We're, we're, uh, we're slightly ahead of schedule here anyway, so that uh, doesn't matter if we cut it a little bit short. <coughs> so we were talking about uh, the crane capacity and the crane characteristics and heave compensation. And factors that we need to consider when we're uh, going to do a lift offshore is, of course, the weight of what we are lifting, both in air and in water. water. So uh, do the calculation with regards to buoyancy, how much, how much buoyant force is, uh, is the uh, object going to experience. We need to calculate the necessary lift height below hook. And that basically means that when we have a crane, we sometimes have uh, see didn't I have a line here? There it is. Just need some space here. So we have the vessel, and uh, we have a crane, and we're going to lift something up. So the crane has a certain height that it can lift, and the hook needs a little bit of space below the tip of the crane, uh, basically just for shackles and everything uh, connected to, to the hook. And then we have the hook itself there. Uh, so what we then need to know is if we're going to lift something fairly big on top of here and we want wires going from each of the corners and to our hook, how, how much space do we have uh, between, between the top of the uh, object and up to the highest point of our uh, hook? So, so that uh, b because if if uh, we need to have a higher angle, so if the angle here needs to be larger in order to, to distribute the weight correctly, uh, we're going to need more space up to, to the hook. But the hook has a maximum that it can, can travel upwards, so, so it, it's going to stop when it reaches the, uh, the crane boom, so, so it can't go any further. So we need to know how much space do we have basically between here. So the height, uh, lift height below the hook, uh, and that's very necessary, especially when we're uh, when we're lifting larger objects, where we often need to use uh, different kinds of arrangements, lifting arrangements, as they're called, uh, which could be like this, where you just have wires going to to each of the corners, but it could also be that you need an intermediary yoke, uh, which could be uh, if you have the uh, crane hook coming down, and it might be connected to a large beam, and the beam again might be connected to the corners of whatever it is that you're be, uh, going to lift, so, so that uh, suddenly you need your object is all the way down here, and you have that beam, and you have all of these wires, and everything takes space, so, so that you need to have you need to know how much height you're going to need uh, below the hook. Uh, you're also going to uh, have to know the necessary work radius of the boom, so that when when this one swings outwards here, it's going to be able to have a certain radius out here, so it can can extend the boom to a certain point, so so that it is going to have a certain le length from from the crane that it can can uh, move it. And we're going to have to know how much do we need in order to, to uh, get this safely uh, through the waves. <coughs> and also we have to know the vulnerability of whatever it is that we're lifting uh, with regards to sudden shocks during the landing or, or even during the lifting. Because if you're unlucky exactly when you're lifting it up, 
uh, the vessel suddenly can experience uh, a tremor with, if a really, lar really large wave hits uh, the vessel. So, so the vessel can sort of jump and jerk a little bit. So, so you can actually get shocks uh, while you're starting to lift also. So um <coughs> you need to know about that, uh, especially if you have some very finely tuned uh, electronics equipment and stuff inside there. It's, uh, you, you need to know, can this handle be uh, jumped about a little bit in there? So, so um, uh, that's something we, we need to keep in mind. And we also need to know if we're going to have to use uh, guidelines or assisting winches in order to, to keep it in the proper orientation while we're uh, moving it around in order to avoid having uh, parts that are sticking out of the object that we're lifting to, to crash into uh, other stuff. So we need to know about that. Yes? The difference between a winch and a crane is basically a crane has a boom. Uh, so the crane has basically an arm which it can reach with. The winch is just a, a drum. So inside the crane there is a winch. So, so we have a winch there also, but, but the crane is a larger structure which has more uh, on it, while the winch I is basically just a drum uh, connected to uh, either a hydraulic or electric motor that is going to either pay out more, uh, more uh, wire or pull in wire. So, so that's all the, the winch does. I, I, it either r releases more wire out or it pulls in more wire. So, so that's, a, uh, that's the only thing the winch does. But, but you do have a winch inside the crane. But, but the crane also has loads of hydraulic systems to move, uh, move the arm and everything. So it was a good question. Uh, um, uh, very necessary to clarify it. So I'm a bit unsure with the tugboats tomorrow if they actually have uh, any cranes on board. But I do know that they do have uh, uh, very powerful winches because they are supposed to be able to pull large vessels. So th these are fairly small vessels, but they are supposed to be able to pull very large ones. So I've seen, uh, I know uh, <coughs> a buddy of mine uh, is working with uh, automation of uh, winches and everything for, for a company named Kalme Winch over at Bigness. And uh, he, w he was actually the one who, who tipped me off about uh, when you were uh, going to Costa anyway, why not also visit uh, the tugboats there? Because uh, they are uh, very good boats, so he, he's actually done work on, on the winches they have uh, on those. And he's, he's uh, I think it was last summer, he was down in, in uh, Turkey uh, on a new boat that was being built in the Black Sea. Uh, and uh, they were going to test it. So they had people from DNV there also that were going to sort of test uh, the pulling capacity of this tugboat. Uh, and then it's called a, a bollard pull. So basically how many tons of vessel can this tugboat uh, pull? And uh, I think it was supposed to be able to pull 1,500 tons or something. And uh, what they did in order to test this was that they connected the, uh, the winch, so, so the wire of the winch, they, they connected it to uh, somewhere safe on land, something that would, could handle that much pulling force. So something that was so, uh, so uh, anchored on, on the shore that it, it, it could handle being pulled at for 1,500 tons. Uh, and then they just started paying out wire and then they started pulling with the uh, tugboat. And what happened was that they were pulling for all, uh, all that it was worth, all 1,500 bollard uh, tons. And then my buddy uh, went over with his uh, cell phone up and he was uh, filming it. And then he just started the winch and the winch started pulling the boat backwards. So the boat has uh, engines that are capable of pulling at 1,500 tons and the winch my buddy had uh, created could pull the entire boat backwards while it was pulling with 1,500 tons. So it was a really powerful winch. So, so it could counteract uh, the pull of, uh, of the tugboats. So, so it was uh, uh, pretty amazing to watch that video. And you could just see, and, and the even the DMV guy was sort of like totally surprised. Well, like, wow, <laughs> we're going the wrong way. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the kinds of forces that you can get with hydraulic winches and stuff like that is pretty amazing uh, how much uh, you can get. But that's at least the, the difference between a winch and a crane, uh, where a crane has more, uh, more uh, structure to it. <coughs> uh, and we also need to consider the uh, dynamic forces of, of the, uh, the object that we're lifting. Uh, for an example, if it has been pre-filled with water in order to, to avoid having it being slowly filled with water as it's sinking through the, the splash zone, 
So if it has been pre-filled so that it's going to sink quickly through the splash zone, uh, that's going to mean that we have water sloshing about inside there while we're lifting it. So that's going to greatly affect the dynamic forces on, on the object itself. But also as soon as it hits, uh, hits the uh, ocean surface, it's going to, uh, to experience hydrodynamic forces. And we have to take those into account also. So uh, with D&D, uh, &D, they have uh, quite a lot of rules and regulations for how stuff is supposed to be done. And uh, one of their rules for planning and execution of marine operations, they have this equation set up. It's the DHL equals the DAF and the weight and the weight of the rig plus SL. So we're going to look at what all of this means. It looks uh, pretty pretty Latin right now. So DHL, that's the dynamic hook load. So <coughs> D and V are usually fond of just using abbreviations instead of Greek letters for, for stuff. So, so they often just use, use like DHL here uh, when they're when they're doing their calculations. So DHL, the dynamic hook load, so basically the forces that are working on, on our hook where it's connected to the lifting wire. <coughs> w is the weight of the load that we're lifting in air. So, so the weight in air. W rig is the weight of the lifting arrangement or the rigging. So if we have one of these uh, extra yokes or, or lifting beams or anything like that that we need uh, to use in order to manage this lift, we have to add that weight also because that is also going to affect uh, the point where the hook is connected to, to the uh, lifting wire. Then we have the DAF, which is a dynamic amplification factor. And for offshore, offshore operations, we usually set it to 1.3. Uh, in some cases, I've seen it uh, set to 1.5. But that depends a bit on uh, what weather conditions they are expecting uh, and, and stuff like that. So uh, usually you'll, when you're looking in, in the regulations, it recommends 1.3. Uh, and it also sets some, some uh, requirements for, for uh, what you need, uh, what kind of conditions you need for using 1.3. So, uh, and then if you're outside those uh, requirements, you're, you're going to have to increase it. Uh, so have more than 1.3 instead. <coughs> and then SL is special loads, such as the, the uh, hydrodynamic mass that's going to be added as soon as you hit the water, uh, and, uh, and, and also uh, the buoyancy. And also the forces that you're going to get from your assisting lines with the assisting winches and, and guidelines because they are also going to be pulling on, on your, uh, uh, on your uh, objects, so that they're, they're going to be affecting the total, uh, total uh, loads that it's uh, experiencing. <coughs> so we're not going to do any uh, particular calculations with this one, but this is just an example to show that there is more that you need to take into account than just saying that you're lifting uh, this much weight. You actually have to you actually have to take uh, a lot of extra precautions when you're calculating it. <coughs> then we're going to look at crane characteristics. Uh, so this is the uh, working radius, as it says all the way down here. So this is both in Norwegian and in, uh, in English. Preferably, we would have had everything in both Norwegian and English so that you could learn the language while you were uh, learning the uh, course curriculum also. But... Uh, Unfortunately, I only have this one in, in Norwegian and English. <coughs> so we have uh, the working radius down here on the uh, x-axis. And you can see it goes all the way from 0 and up to 24 meters. So up to 24 meters, that's how far this crane boom can reach. And you can uh, just think about the amount of uh, torque that you're going to get if you extend it all the 24 uh, meters. So you're going to, uh, you have 24 meters of arm, uh, arm length uh, between your force and your uh, pivot point. So that's uh, quite a lot of torque you're going to, uh, to uh, put on it. <coughs> uh, and then you have, um, I think the crane boom itself actually just goes to 20, and then we have an auxiliary winch that goes all the way to 24, as I say. Uh, and then we have on the y-axis here, we have the load, so the amount of weight uh, that it's uh, possible to take. And then we can see 
all the way out to approximately 8.3, we can have full weight on this uh, uh, on this uh, uh, crane boom. So, so all the way out to 8.3 meters, it, it can handle the uh, the entire weight uh, in its capacity, which is probably 140 or something. Uh, and then as we move further out, uh, so as we are extending it even further out, the crane boom, the capacity is going to be dropping. So if we go out to 11.2 meters, we can go up to this uh, this line. So 120 uh, is the capacity of the winch. So uh, that's the lower line here. So there are some percentages that are put in here. Yeah, that's if you are uh, uh, loading it past its capacity. So uh, that's the uh, alarm percentages. <coughs> so if we are extending the boom to 11.2 meters, if we go up here, we find the uh, the line for for the capacity of the uh, crane boom, and we go over here and we figure out that we have just 89 tons of capacity when it's at 11.2 meters. So instead of, if we stayed at 8.3, we would have had the full 120 tons of capacity for the crane. But as soon as we move past 8.3 out to 11.2, we're down at 89. If we move even further, all the way out to 20, then we're down at just 50 tons. So we just by extending it all the way, we've more than halved uh, the amount of uh, weight that it can actually lift at that uh, uh, that work radius. So it's going to be important uh, then to know if our crane is located over on the side of the ship, like here, we need to know how far out do we uh, do we have to uh, to lift this object in order to avoid avoid it crashing into uh, to the side of the ship. So let us say that in this case we 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 needed uh, 15 meters. So we needed to get the, the module 15 meters out. So we need to locate 15. So I think it's this one going up here, over there. So that's 60 tons, so only half. So even though we have a crane uh, that's uh, designed for 120 tons, since we need to uh, lift it 15 meters across the side of the ship, uh, it can only handle half of the weight. So it's... Uh, something to think about when, when you're uh, designing a lifting operations like this, because <coughs> uh, quite possibly in this situation, if, if what we were supposed to lift was actually 120 tons, then we would simply have to upgrade to a larger vessel. So maybe we would need a construction vessel instead of an IMR vessel, because a construction vessel will have a larger crane uh, with, with a better crane capacity. And it will probably be able to lift it 50 meters out and still uh, be able to lift uh, 120 tons. <coughs> Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, this uh, this characteristic I is individual for each crane, so uh, or each uh, crane model basically. So so if you have the same crane on two different vessels, it's going to have the same uh, same work radius uh, and characteristics, but. Uh, but so, so long uh, as soon as you start changing uh, something in the design of the crane, you need to, to create a new uh, a new crane characteristic uh, for it. <coughs> uh, then we'll look a little bit at passive heave compensation, and then I think we'll do a break and, and continue on on Thursday. So for passive heave compensation, I'm just going to do the uh, the stuff on the side here before we watch the watch the animation. <coughs> if it's a passive uh, heave compensation, it means that we have some sort of elastic element connected to our lift. So usually it is connected between, uh, between the, the crane hook and uh, whatever it is that you're connecting. So it's going to affect the total height that you need uh, below your crane hook. Uh, and it can be uh, usually an elastic element. It's uh, some sort of uh, hydraulic cylinder which is connected to an accumulator when it's, uh, when it's in work. Uh, uh, and this elastic element, it can be both stretched or compressed. So usually when it's in, in, in sort of uh, neutral mode, uh, it's going to be all the way in. But as soon as you start lifting something, it's going to stretch a bit. But it's not going to stretch all the way uh, because it, uh, it's going to stretch about halfway so that it has just as much room to move uh, compress into the cylinder as it has to, uh, to uh, expand out of it. 
uh, so that it's going to be, once the load has been lifted up, it's going to sort of be hanging there, and all motion that you get is going to be dampened by, by this, uh, uh, this cylinder, so that you will have the top part of the cylinder will be moving in accordance with the crane boom and, and the motions of the vessel, while the uh, object that's hanging below there uh, is going to be uh, have a lot less motion, uh, vertical motion, because it's being moved in and out of the uh, cylinder. So we're going to see it in, in the clip here afterwards. <coughs> uh, yeah, so, um, it's like the hydraulic cylinder connected to uh, an accumulator. And this means that we can avoid shock loads and very large hydrodynamic forces. So it's especially good uh, as you're hitting the waves. Uh, so when you're lowering it down and hitting the surface of the water, you usually get quite large uh, uh, shock loads. Um, and then uh, that's going to be the uh, not completely avoided, but uh, very much diminished by the passive heave uh, compensation like this. So I think we have one more there. <coughs> the only problem with the passive stuff is that you can end up with something called eigenfrequency. Uh, and that means means that if, if you hit the eigenfrequency of this elastic system, uh, you're going to get uncontrollable and very dangerous motion. So, so it's sort of going to feed itself, so it's going to start moving more and more and more. Uh, so that's a pretty dangerous stuff that is going to happen. Um, so I think that was uh, it there. We're going to see the clip now, and we're also going to see the clip on the next one, because that uh, sort of explains a bit about eigenfrequency. Can you see the uh, screen at all? Or <laughs> I'm going to try if, uh, if I have some uh, controls here. There, there's no controls in the back there, so. Okay, so, uh, so at least what it's showing here is um, something being lowered down, and we can see the movement of the ship uh, with waves. And we can see that the uh, hydraulic cylinder is being extended and compressed. Uh, and here we can also read off the different loads that we're experiencing. So the, the red one is the load that the cylinder is experiencing, while the blue one is the load that uh, the object is, is experiencing, basically. So you can see that it's the cylinder is moving back and forth and back and forth, while the, um, while the load on the object isn't uh, moving out, uh, practically isn't moving, at least. So it's sort of dampening the, the effect of all of the motions. And we'll just do the next one also. This will explain a bit about eigenfrequency. This is from 1940, Tacoma Bridge. So this is an actual bridge made out of steel and concrete. And it's moving like that. Because it's experiencing day, pretty high wind speeds, like and those wind speeds are hitting the eigenfrequency of, of it. So, so the wind is coming from the side here and hitting it, and it's hitting the eigenfrequency of the bridge, so that it, it is just uh, increasing and increasing these uncontrollable motions. This is just a couple of months after they opened the bridge. So, so this is a completely new bridge that they created in 1940. It's sort of hard to, to understand that this is actually steel and concrete that's moving like that. It looks, looks like yeah, jello almost. The cars. He has but a few minutes in which to save himself. Face to face with fate, his destiny hanging in the balance. Will he heed the last warning or perish with the doomed structure? The insane thing is that there, there were actually people trying to, to drive across but he that saved bridge once they started. By so the, the car that's trapped out there, he, he just had to stop and exit his car and walk, walk away. And if 
think it's like, yeah, I think he says it also. It's like just a couple of minutes after we walked off the bridge, it collapses. No structure so. of steel and concrete can stand such a strain. Steel girders buckle and giant cables snap like puny threads. There it goes! This is sort of the, the, the worst case scenario with the eigenfrequency. So but it's something that can happen in uh, pretty many disaster, different situations as, as soon as you have something girders. that's Others oscillating differ. back and forth. Whatever the reason, so a wave the motion coma will or, or anything like that. This time a bridge that will it's pretty, not uh, pretty a intense how much force you can get from it.